So hi everyone, my name is Rod and I come from a company called uh, Gamesys and Gamesys essentially changed quite a lot in the last three years. So three <laughs> years ago uh, we had like a huge amount of manual processes. We had like a confluence page on when you have to release, you have to tag specific stuff in this particular order and you have to talk to these three people who will then talk to these two people who will then get you back by an email and stuff like that. So it was like quite complex. And we realized that this is not the perfect solution and while DevOps wasn't really that big of a fancy word three years ago, it was already there, it was just not like it is today, we decided to try this new like container stuff and, and all of this automation uh, thingy and we ventured into this. So today we are hopefully better in this, but today I'm going to actually talk about three closely related stories around how we did stuff three years ago, how we do stuff now and how like what's the difference that was caused by us using containers. So some of the stories I will tell today might be overly dramatized, just to get the point across, but <laughs> it's more or less real, so they are not like fake stories. They actually, some of them actually happened in the way I'm going to describe them. But before I venture further, I want to ask about the composition of the audience. So how many of you describe yourself as like developers? <laughs> operations, any operations here? Cool, because I was prepared for lots of operations jokes and only four <laughs> people to offend. <laughs> 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 Management, anything like? Good, good, good. So let's talk about a bit of a uh, game sys. We have around like a thousand employees. It's, fa it's like fairly large. It's not really a startup anymore and around 40% of these work in a, in a technical way. Now, Gamesys is massively a Java-based company. It is Java-heavy, so we have a fair amount of Java devs. You can't really do Java on the front end. You can try, we've tried, not a good idea. So we have our fair share of normal front-end developers working in JavaScript or Objective-C Swift on, on iOS. We are a gambling company making quite a lot of games, so we do need people to design the games and actually code the games. We also have like a fair amount of operations guys to make sure that our code actually works and is accessible online. So another question to the audience, this is the last, I promise. Uh, who do you think I am from, from these four things? So who, do you think I'm a Java dev? Yeah. 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 <laughs> So you probably think I'm a Java dev, which is wrong, because I'm a Ruby developer. <laughs> <laughs> I am Gamesys and to be a Ruby developer. Now, why does a Java company need a Ruby developer is a good question of itself, but it does tie in nicely to my first story, which is how we did the Ruby upgrade. Now, it was three years ago, and we decided that yeah, Ruby 1.8 is already aging, it's end of life, no security support, so we want to migrate over to Ruby 1.9. Now, if you don't know Ruby, you might think this is just a small upgrade, but it's actually a quite big change in, in, in Ruby. It's comparable to like from going from Python 2 to Python 3, with some other examples, or from like Windows XP to Windows 7. So it's a, it's a quite big change. There's new stuff there, the ABI has changed, the language has changed, some semantics have changed, and also 1.8 was already end of life. So we wanted to upgrade. Now, Ruby, as I've said, Gamesys is a Java-based company, Ruby was a finished technology. We did use it for one particular very important applications, because usually you use your fringe technologies for very important applications inside your company. So we went to operations. And the conversation was like, please, the operations guys, we bow down to you. Can you please upgrade Ruby on the live systems? And they were like, uh, can't do. You're still on Red Hat 6. Red Hat 6 only supports Ruby 1.8. Nope, you're, still, you're stuck. But OK, can you please install it from like other RPM, like Fedora or, or, or something else? Nope, tried all of them. None of them work with Red Hat 6. Sorry, you're out of luck. You can't do Ruby 1.8, uh, Ruby 1.9. Uh, 
could you compile it from source? I mean, that's quite normal. Nope. This is a live machine. GCC, not a live, no live machines. It's a security risk. Sorry. Go away. Can we try like compile it on staging and move it to live? Yeah, we tried it, but they have slightly different libraries. It does set faults. Sorry, can't do. Now, I told you this story in like one minute, but obviously, each of these conversation points took one to two weeks to, to get there. And eventually, we did manage to get it done in around six months. Now, during these six months, we, as we also had to do other upgrades, like feature requests from the business, which meant that during these six months, we had to do two completely separate branch of our application, one with one eight, one always to do the same stuff with one nine, double the effort of testing, of QAing, etc. And obviously, meanwhile, we were also always waiting for operations to come back with the latest no answer. Now, as I said in the beginning, some of the stuff I told you is probably overly dramatized, so I went into our ticketing system in Jira and checked the exact timers, because I was sure it's not six months. And yes, it wasn't. It was only <laughs> five months and three weeks. So I'm terribly sorry. But in the end, we did manage to deploy. It was a huge convoluted mess of installing GCC, then compiling Ruby, then removing GCC, because that's fine. If you remove GCC, that's not a security risk anymore. <laughs> so we did manage it. It took a while, but, but we, we managed to do this. So this was three years ago. Now, as I've said, GameSys did introduce a huge amount of new stuff in the last three years, we introduced Docker, Ansible, Ansible Tower, GoCD, automated build pipelines, continuous integration, continuous delivery. Now we have a platform team, a part of the platform team. We use now Artifactory, we upgraded to Red Hat 7, blah, blah, blah. Actually, it says blah, blah, blah there. <laughs> so, one year ago, once we moved lots of our stuff onto containers, made sure that they deploy using Ansible, not like some handcrafted scripts that we tell the operations guys to run. We wanted to upgrade from Ruby 1.9 to Ruby 2.1. And this was quite relaxing effort. This, this is the only thing we did. We just changed the Docker file. 1.9.3 to 2.1.5 and we could relax. And everything took like one week. And from that it was like, the change took like a few minutes and then waiting for testers QAs because they were really, really like, oh, it's, it, it can't be that simple. It must, there must have been some problems. You have to extensively test everything from top to bottom. But one week later, it was there and it's deployed. So this is the success story we've had, one of the three stories. Now, it's not completely a success story because when I did the first Ruby upgrade, I was promised that the next Ruby upgrade, because it will probably be harder, I might go to Malta, where our operations guys do, and do like something like this. But because it was so easy, I couldn't go to Malta. <laughs> so it's a success story for a company, not for me. Which leads nicely to our second story, a story where containers failed us, which is how we did the Java upgrade. So you might wonder, if the Ruby upgrade was like this, why was the Java upgrade so much different after we switched over to containers? <coughs> and the solution of the why is because GameSys is a Java-based company. It has massive established processes, like every company with more than 1,000 employees do, around Java. So a Java upgrade looks like the security guys get like reports, oh, there's a new Java build version, it's very important, it fixes critical bugs and critical security issues. Let's deploy it. So they tell release management that, hey, there's a new Java version, you need to deploy it, let's plan for release. And the release goes to operations who are like, okay, we assign three operations engineers to work on this task so it can be done as soon as possible. It's such a huge task, we, there's actually like multiple engineers needed, and then the SSH to the machine, and then just do the upgrade. So this is how it was happening like three years ago. Obviously, the usual stuff happened, the usage of the Docker, Ansible, blah, blah, blah. And let's see how the Java upgrade went. So obviously, the security guy gets a report that there's a new Java version, 
Release management says operations, hey, please plan for the release. Operations assign engineers to do the task, and the engineers are like, okay. So previously we did SSH, and now we use Docker, so let's go to Google Code, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Check how to access Docker. <laughs> SSH to the box, then you do Docker exec to the container, and install the Java <laughs> <laughs> Now. Anyone who used Docker before knows that this is not only won't work, it's actively dangerous. I mean, best case scenario, this does nothing. And that's the best case scenario. Worst case scenario, it introduces weird to find sec condition faults, bugs, uh, errors, uh, stuff like that. And we went through two Java updates with this methodology after someone realized that, hey, after I did the Java upgrade, Java is still the old version, but that's what's <laughs> happening. So what they did is this time, is they actually told us, the platform team, that hey, something's wrong with the Docker containers. <laughs> we upgraded Java and it's still the old version. <laughs> yeah. So anyone who doesn't know Docker, you have to build it from, from scratch. After you modify it, it's, it's not the same. It's like modifying something after it's being built. You can do it, you can try, but most likely it won't, won't hurt. And why, why has it failed? It's because the devs were skipped from this part. Devs were always skipped from this part. This was a completely written down process on how to upgrade Java. Developers were never involved. How do devs uh, do the Java upgrade? Obviously, they press the skip this version button every time they get this one. <laughs> <laughs> That's how devs do the Java upgrade. It's perfectly normal. I, I did this. <laughs> this pop-up came up yesterday and I, I was like, oh, I can use it in my, in my presentation and then, then I immediately press skip this version. Strapless. So, let me do a comparison on the Ruby and the Java upgrade. So, Ruby upgrade, there were no established processes. It was initiated by the devs, like from the bottom up. Operations didn't really have the knowledge, not that they really wanted to know anything about Ruby. And this means that in the end, containers ease the process in operations, it eased the process in development, it was fine. On the Java end, however, we had established processes. They were completely outside of the dev scope, and operations knew how to do the Java upgrade, and containers just got in the way. Because although we switched over to containers, our processes were not modified. And now, today's talk is more about containers and not about like DevOps as, a, as like a larger uh, structure, how to structure or, or do your company. And uh, usually they say that DevOps and containers come like in hand in hand. They don't really, you can do containers without going like full on the DevOps scale, like doing all automation. You can just say, okay, Docker is just just a package, just like a jar file or a Ruby gem or something which that operations can deploy by hand. But even if you only even if you think containers about just like a packaging system, you also you already need to shift some of the responsibilities. Every process that that modifies the operating system you have to run, that modifies like basic stuff, Java versions, configuration, which was usually done by the operations team, and now is part of the container, you need to be aware of them. And this is called like shift left. So that's the dev guys trying to push something to operations and then the operations guys like, oh, no, please not. So this is like a shift left operation. The oper some stuff from operations have to go back to the dev side. And this was like some things we learned. Not really, because we still do this. <laughs> But now, at least the security guy knows that they also have to talk to us <coughs> when they want to do a Java upgrade. And I think we did like two since then properly by modifying the, the Docker file. So this was like one of the positives and I've talked about some of the negatives. So now let's head to our third story, which is a story about the future. In the future, we want to do this. Relax. Uh, one really good benefit of working at games is, is that you get really nice presentation backgrounds, and I use this like <laughs> three times. <laughs> <laughs> this is definitely my my favorite background from, from all of them. 
because we want to achieve this. Just, just be, be relaxed. But we're not there yet. We, we are definitely not there yet. And we recently had an internal uh, presentation. Uh, one of our technical architects did a presentation on why our staging environment is unstable. Because we have like a production environment, we have a big staging environment, and we have a huge amount of micro staging environments for the development teams to, to work against and integrate their code against. And they are really, really, really unstable. And people are usually wondering, why are they, they unstable? Are they because they are under spec? Obviously, I mean, we don't really want to have a full prod environment 40 times over, it's just a waste of resources. Is it because they have beta software at them? Maybe. I mean, everyone just pushes their latest creation onto these environments. Maybe it's just they're unstable because there's so many snapshots and beta versions of our infrastructure there. Or is it because just too many people have access to them? I mean, on prod environment, it's not like a dev can just go there and install what they want. There's like a defined process at the moment. So they were usually wandering around this, and in the end, they always ask for a new microstaging environment, because that usually solves the problem, right? We don't know what the problem is, let's create a new one. <laughs> and this uh, technical architect of ours was like, maybe the problem of our microstaging environments are that they are not looked after by a human. So we have our live environments, and we have operations, and we have this picture, which I've seen in every slide, which shows <laughs> the players and devils. So I had to include it in my presentation as well. And it's literally, the problem is from our perspective is it, it doesn't even work fine in dev. But it's ops problem. Because what do operations do? They monitor the live system. They, they check for CPU usage, for load, for memory. They preemptively kill the application if the memory limit is reached. They, they do all of this by hand. And that's why our production environment works, because we write crappy code that doesn't adhere to like the specifications and, and it just hogs all of the memory and, and CPU. But there are operations guys who fix our problems, who fix our code by preemptively restarting it. And they've been doing this for three years. They are so good in doing this, they don't even tell us anymore. Because <laughs> they believe we know that our code is bad, but in fact, we don't. And that's why we, we don't really know why our microstaging environments are in a bad shape. It's because there's no human to look after our microstaging environments. So, usual slide. Now, we are doing lots of continuous integration and continuous delivery. And our deployment strategy is really based on Ansible scripts, which is better than just telling operations that, hey, here's some like, two Docker containers, please deploy them to host A and B and C. We actually send them an Ansible script that does this. It just deploys uh, the Docker container to host A and B. And we have to like hand manage this. So we have to inside these, these scripts, it's like hard-coded where each of the containers should go. So resource management is still manual, and it's quite error-prone. When someone creates a new service, they're like, OK, where should it go? Obviously, host A, because that's the first in the line. That's why host A needs 16 gigs of RAM, because there are three times as many uh, services on host A than on all other hosts, because host A is the first one. And everyone's just like, oh, this probably can go to host A. It's perfectly fine. So obviously, this is our aim. And we really hope that Kubernetes will help us get to this aim, because it will allow us to automate the resource management. And that's something of our own future. That's something we want to achieve. Because Kubernetes will hopefully allow us to push our stuff automatically to the environment where our resources automatically scale up and down and also remove the manual labor to need it to kill the resources. But I'm not going to talk about Kubernetes. Stefan will do that. So I'm going to uh, ask him to <laughs> continue this uh, around Kubernetes. And thank you very much. And we're also hiring. <laughs>